would say from the arm and the leg. If you could offer that, even as an alpha size. But right now, that would not be valuable because on the other side, also nobody knows how to consume them. No, no, they don't care about that. Two sided marketplace. Get them to, because you know who's the first customer on the other side? Me. So, oh, yeah, for oh, them. Yes. I run their ACL. Yes. yes. For my ACL, you need that data. I do. Yeah. So this, I would be the initial use case, and then have all of that be when a patient discharges and doesn't see their doctor in 40 hours, everyone gets it. That, so I need to know this is an ACO patient. They've got a 40 hour clock. Let's yeah, you need to be able to run queries in real time over this data. Yeah, that's, what I'm that's what I'm saying. So, what I'm saying to you is Trinity is already in Alpha Production Instrument. They've got a Paradata, they call it the Paradata Database. They're storing it in there and they put a little um, solar engine on top so you can do a solar query. But then, even at Trinity, where they have hundreds of thousands of patients in these areas, they don't have a mechanism. There's no, they have Apogee too. But today, the Apogee thing doesn't have to be Right. I understand. But if you, had, if you inserted your thing, you would save them money and make them hear us. Trinity would be like, oh, it's a the third, fourth, fifth. CHS or Trinity are no, I don't the top 10 in the country. Uh, yeah, so the thing, as I said before, we are doing this, we don't have to do it right now. No, no, no. Yeah, so they, they knew it was coming, and they could pre under terms and conditions to say, here's what we think we're going to give you a chance to test it. Is it two years? No, no, no. Yeah. yeah, okay. That would be good. No, no, no. Okay. So, so that was, from my point of view, just to see resonate, from my point of view, the first thing you can do is you have all the data in there, you can give it to other people. Yes. Using it. The second thing you can do is you can run all your analytics on there. Yeah. 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 Sure. The third thing you can do, which is why you know, my team has started all this, is because now you can build models of this stuff. If you want to predict yes. whoever's not going to get, you know, come back. I got a grab for the all this. Yes. You got it. We'll, we'll you, but you, what you just said makes sense. Exactly. And these layers are like this. Okay, folks, if you can begin to move toward your seats.
Uh, Gwen uh, or Vivi, could you uh, shut the door, please? Okay. Um, well, we're off to a terrific start. Um, and we have still a lot of territory to cover. Uh, and uh, it's my uh, privilege, again, to introduce, uh, on this occasion, uh, Peter Pronovost. Uh, and I want to mention something in particular. Peter uh, was really the motivator uh, behind this activity. Uh, it's the result of a number of conversations we had along the way. Uh, and uh, Peter's vision, uh, you all know, uh, his vision in this particular arena has been strategically vital for the meeting we're having today and for the project that uh, he served as uh, co-chair for, along with Mike Johns, who's going to be moderating the next panel, uh, another visionary a contributor to, uh, to so many things, but in particular to uh, his leadership and interoperability. So it's a great pleasure for me to uh, introduce and welcome uh, the co-chair of the activity, Peter Pervos, the patient safety champion, um, really a legend in the patient safety world. Uh, he's a practicing critical care physician, a member of the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, his, uh, he's contributed uh, more to the literature than any 10 people would uh, ever hope to uh, contribute. Uh, and more than that, he's brought a spirit to everything he does uh, that has a transformative capacity. Uh, so Peter, thank you very much for your partnership in this work and for your chairmanship of this uh, particular panel. Uh, Michael, thank you. And we're delighted to put this panel t together for you and uh, we hope it opens up some of our thinking for this. Uh, a little bit of background. I uh, was speaking with a woman whose husband died of a misdiagnosis. He was getting care at a health system, got sent out for some tumor marker lab at an outside lab company, but that company doesn't sync with the health system's lab, so it never got ingested back into their data systems. They found it a year later, but his tumor had grown and he died. I spoke with a primary care doc who's trying to manage a dual eligible patient who's frail, has many social issues, and found out that that patient is getting care from about seven different social systems, but none of them talk to each other, so he has no way to manage wh where they're getting food or where he's, if he's filling his prescriptions. And we started thinking about how we might solve this, and my colleagues at APL uh, shared with us that this idea of maybe we ought to start thinking like an engineer rather than a biomedical researcher. What does that mean? I engineers solve problems. They start at the end and work backwards. We in healthcare solve puzzles. We think and go forward, and Julie, your slide of the framework is so illustrative because if we were an engineer, we would say what's the end game of population health affordability and work backwards to design the system because though there's amazing progress, I have to say if I were to say the empiric evidence that what did we buy from this money we've spent on health IT, it's pretty hard to say the investments were, were produced much. The, no data that healthcare cost is bent, indeed Berkshire Hathaway's announcement today symbols that. Quality doesn't seem to have budged. Patient experience hasn't really budged. Even though patients could access portals, they don't seem to be that satisfied with it. And clinician productivity is down rather than up. And, and that's not to say that putting these systems in weren't needed. But I think we too often, thinking like a biomedical researcher, saw that as the end rather than a means to improved population health. But we're poised to begin to change that, and that's what this session is, is all about. There's some fascinating work to say that if healthcare could just get half the productivity gains, healthcare, as you may know, has negative productivity despite spending a lot on technology, we could solve our healthcare cost problems. We don't have to say who should get care or not, and interoperability can go a long way of solving the safety and the productivity problems. And you know, as an example of how other industries, and you're going to hear from several other industries who've solved this, just think of 
Lyft or Uber. You may know there's five different technologies. It's not one technology that all works seamlessly. We as the consumer don't even think about that, but there's an Amazon service, a Twilio, a Google, a Braintree, all aligned to give the consumer a seamless experience. In thinking about this, our APL colleagues looked at thinking of interoperability at three tiers. And Julian, you've been great at this, as is uh, Dr. Johns with, with your organization. The, the first year is what the secretary was talking about, connecting at a macro level, hospital to hospital. A VA patient goes to get care at Montefiore. Do, does that information come back into, into, to, to the VA? Second tier is the meso tier, and there's used opportunity, for example, some estimates are nurses spend 25 to 30 percent of their time hunting for supplies. Why? Because that last 10 feet of supply chain hasn't been managed. There's no link in the EMR with the various supply chain. It's solvable, but it's 30 percent waste in our health system. And the micro tier, which I think has often been connected, neglected, but without that, you can't aggregate data up to population health. And this is a warfighter is on a ship out in the Pacific Ocean, and the, we integrate their blood pressure, their pulse ox, their heart rate to early predict who has sepsis, and they get the exact same treatment they would get as if they were at Mayo or Emory or MGH. And that, I think, is the vision that we have to begin to, begin to, to look at. I, I say, that despite that humbling beginning, that I'm hopeful. And I'm hopeful because when we became students of other industries. There was a confluence of forces that drove this, this together. One were regulations, and Don, I think we've made amazing progress, and those have been etching up. The standards, and the, the work on the standards has been accelerated. I don't think that's the, the, the barrier anymore. And then the engineering piece and the analytics to use the big data, the machine learning and the scientists are all there. What is missing in our hypothesis is the leadership to start demanding that when we purchase devices that they talk together. You see, if you think about the value equation in this IT system, putting the systems in, though needed, may have negative value. There's hurts in productivity, there's a lot of costs. Beginning to do some interoperability, Julie, as you showed, has more value, but 90, 90 plus percent of the value comes in getting data out integrating it with other systems. And the EMR will become an, a decreasingly important component of the data. It'll be IoT and personal data so that you can predict things, you could use decision support, you could monitor and, and learn. And the main barrier to that, or a lagging barrier, is those who purchase the, the technologies demand that they have interoperability. You'll, you'll hear from Bill and, and Meredith and others and importantly, our APL colleagues, that those standards were always a barrier in every other industry. It was the people who buy the stuff are the ones who turn the needle because they start demanding it with discipline and um, hard-nosed contracting. When uh, Andy Gettinger and I were talking about the difference between what might a specification contract look like when you're putting an airplane in or a submarine, and what might it look like when you're buying an EMR? There, I mean, one's two paragraphs, one's 300 pages, right? Just, we haven't got into thinking that engineering detail, and we believe that that could be a, an accelerant that has lagged to date, but together we could probably do it. And it's gonna be hard for any one of us to do that alone. So the report that we uh, put forth was, premised on that hypothesis that the purchasing of technologies is an accelerant that hasn't been fully tapped, and if tapped, could really drive change. The priorities that we put forth on this are, uh, number one, for health system leaders to commit, that is declare that this interoperability is a priority. Not being delusional, Julie, that getting data out alone is gonna be the value. The value is doing things with it, of coupling it with your uh, analytics and machine learning and your scientists and your clinicians. Two is to identify a set of very specific interoperability goals and importantly requirements documents as our engineers would say they're not going to start with with going forward they start with what is the, are the requirements and work backwards and demand it. 
We will need to collaborate, as Joe Chiani has done with this patient safety movement of getting people to sign pledges. Writing requirements documents are really labor intensive. They're expensive. An organization like the VA, I think, could, could do it, but short of that, it's probably beyond the scope, I think, of any even large health system. But together, and there's many organizations in the room that could bring us together, we could consider putting requirements documents in the public domain that people could share, that could iterate, and we hope an outcome of this might be some effort to that. And then really get the technical people to write those specifications. Because most of the CIOs or CEOs who are writing this, they don't have the time, they may not have the resources to write those specifications. But if they were available, we could draw upon them. And then finally, we will need to begin to assess that at the end of the day, we are really dri driving, driving value. Because I think for too long in healthcare, we got enamored with the processes, figuring out is Coke better than Pepsi, rather than, as our APL colleagues to say, or I want to put a man on the moon, and am I achieving that starting with the goal of the triple aim, affordability, and improving health care? So with that, I'm delighted to introduce our uh, panel. We have uh, a great experienced panel who are going to share with you ways that this was done from outside of health care and get, give some examples that I hope will reinforce this point that a big driver is the people who buy it demand it. And that hasn't been as robust as it is in healthcare. So my, the next speaker that I'll turn it over to is my friend and colleague, uh, Cezan Palmer. Cezan uh, is the mission lead at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. This, by the way, is part of the university who has, what, like 2,200 systems engineers who help manage the Pluto mission, hardcore system engineers who've done this in many industries. Cezan? Okay, good morning. Um, thank you, Peter. So uh, our goal with the technical supplement was really to provide a tangible, kind of specific set of guidelines for how purchasers, healthcare organizations, could go about driving interoperability. Um, we heard a lot of uh, discussion this morning, great discussion about uh, cooperation, alignment. I think that's one of the critical aspects that we're going to talk about moving forward in terms of um, how you begin to get your arms around what those uh, <laughs> standards and implementation uh, requirements are that move this forward. Um, one thing just to point out, we've talked about interoperability and some have used the term um, open standards. When we say interoperable, we are talking about open architecture systems as well. So, um, you know, think about systems where you can replace a subsystem with minor or no impact on the system as a whole. So we use the term interoperability a lot, but we're also um, talking about openness. So just to orient you to the technical supplement, um, I'm going to spend my few minutes this morning focused on technical supplement A, which is the overarching framework um, where we provide kind of a step-by-step -step approach to how you can implement interoperability. Um, but there are three other technical supplements. Uh, technical supplement B I'll touch on briefly, but it's really a deep dive into an approach for identifying interoperability needs or requirements. And so we walk through some detailed examples there um, in terms of how organizations can go about identifying those needs and requirements. Technical supplement, supplement C um, provides specific language, um, and a lot of this is drawn on our experience working with the government and the DOD. Um, but there's specific language to be incorporated in requests for proposals that go out to uh, industry uh, vendors in order to ensure that the requirements that were identified are captured appropriately um, in, the, in the RFPs. And then finally, the last technical supplement is focused on some case studies to help illuminate how uh, this transformation has occurred in other industries. And as Peter mentioned, you'll hear more about that um, a little later. So um, the overarching framework has four major components, and I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these. Uh, but one I wanted to mention, you see the long-range interoperability roadmap there. That's key, and as Peter mentioned, um, as engineers, we start with the end in mind. And so you know, identifying where you want to go and then developing that plan to get there is critical. So I'll step through each of these uh, briefly. 
So the interoperability steering group is really um, kind of the owner of this transformation. Um, it has to be a decision-making body that has the authority to go out and uh, develop these procurement guidelines, um, engage with stakeholders, and really be the advocate for ensuring uh, interoperability uh, across the organization. Um, they would be responsible for staying abreast of developments of various standards and implementation um, guidelines that are available to the community. Um, and pulling that together and, and being that champion to work across the organization and develop that framework to achieve interoperability. This is also the group, as we talked about, um, cooperation and alignment across organizations. If you can imagine you know, different uh, organizations, each with their interoperability steering groups, they would be the ones to work together to define a common set of standards and implementation guides that could be used across uh, the industry. So um, the long-range interoperability roadmap is key, and the, uh, the ISG, the Interoperability Steering Group, would really take ownership for this and develop this roadmap. This would be a multi-year plan. You know, we talked about a lot of the challenges with interoperability this morning, so it's not something that's going to happen in a year or probably even a couple years. So this would be a multi-year roadmap that looks at where the organization is today and where you want to go um, in terms of interoperability, and then develop those milestones along the way. And again, this needs to be shared broadly across the organization, embraced uh, across the organization, and really have, as, as Peter mentioned, that strong leadership and that um, consistency in terms of pursuing uh, the, the milestones in the, in the roadmap. The interoperability needs identification process. Um, this is the one that I mentioned. There is a uh, separate technical supplement uh, B that goes into a lot more detail here. There are lots of approaches that can be used, um, block diagrams, flow charts. There are all kinds of ways that you can um, identify those interface requirements and needs uh, for interoperable systems. We focused on something called an N-squared diagram. Um, we like that approach because it's a nice way to identify all of the entities, whether they're systems or people or processes, and identify the required interfaces between them. So it provides a framework to map out the inputs and outputs across each of those entities and really provides that systematic way to capture all those um, interface needs. And then, of course, you would use that coupled with your roadmap and your priorities to identify what the highest priority needs are to roll into um, a specification uh, in, in the RFP. And then finally, the procurement specification process. This is taking those needs that have been identified in the prior steps and then translating that into the specific language to include um, when engaging with vendors for specific products. Um, as we talked about before, there are numerous data exchange standards out there, um, you know, leveraging those that are available from, from ONC and HL7 and the various organizations that we talked about earlier um, would be a useful way to start in terms of identifying best, uh, best practices. And the key is not only identifying those data exchange standards, but also discussing how they're to be implemented, because you can have a set of standards, but implement them differently. And so to really have interoperable and open systems, um, you have to clearly provide that guidance and then use that as the basis from which you would select which vendors uh, to go with to provide that interoperable system across the organization. So that's a very quick summary um, of the framework that we developed. And again, there are a lot more details in the various technical supplements. Um, I think a lot of the words on this slide you've heard before uh, by Peter and various speakers this morning. Um, we're really focused on trying to provide purchasers with the tools to take control uh, of their destiny and define the way forward. Again, thinking long term. Uh, leverage the resources that are out there. Try to find some uh, commonality and alignment across the industry in order to, to drive these, um, these standards, ensure the specification language is in there, uh, and then use that as a way to make selections about how you move forward. Thank you. Great. Th thank you, Suzanne. And I hope you'll see that this appendix was intentionally designed to be very practical and a guide to move the field forward. It's admittedly some new work for us, which is why we think it's going to be more effective collectively, and we hope we can do that. I'd like 
to now move, though, to Bill Johnson to share with you how <clears throat> this isn't just pie in the sky. This is what he did in submarines. They used to not talk. It's a little bit scary. But through his great leadership he and really hard contracting, was able to move the field. And it's a story that I think inspires hope for us in healthcare. Hi. I was, um, I've been involved in um, submarine design and acquisition for over 35 years. Uh, the first 15 years of that were pretty much following on the path of what my predecessors had put together. In the, uh, this is why we changed. In the early 90s, what happened was the Soviets quit. Submarine priority went from, we were number one anti-submarine warfare, we went down to number nine. Troop transport became number one. Our budget went down accordingly. Now, those different colors there have to do with the different types of submarines we have. So it, every, each submarine had a different program to build sonar, a different infrastructure. And there was a lot of money in each of these programs to more or less do the same thing. These systems that we had built on, these digital systems, took anywhere from six to eight years to change. We had a, a prime contractor big company that integrated and built the system. We had a Navy laboratory that uh, <coughs> oversaw that, uh, provided uh, testing of that, uh, took it to sea. There's sort of a cooperative relationship. We had very, there was other people involved, but to a very minor extent. Bill, can you speak closer to the Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? So at 90, 91, 92, in that time frame, we were at rock bottom. Now, what we all thought was, hey, Congress, get your act together, plus us back up there where we need to be. And we assumed that there was going to be operational need to, to be better. Now, on, on the right, that's the former Soviet Union's last nuclear stealth. And you can see further on where we had lost what we call a sonar superiority. In other words, the, the former Soviet Union platforms, their submarines, were approaching ours in terms of quietness, and we assumed their sonar was doing the same. So we didn't have that standoff range, and it was, in forward areas, it was very dangerous to operate because we might cl collide with one another. So we wanted to get that, that range back, <coughs> standoff range. So the idea was, well, uh, and we had an outside group, by the way, that came in and took a look at what we had done and said, hey, there's a lot of new practices that you ought to be looking at. You know, for one thing, submarine sonar is not the only sonar that the Navy builds. There's surface ships and there's surveillance systems. They also do submarines. Uh, the, one of these uh, areas had actually gone ahead and started using commercial off-the-shelf processors, which we didn't do. We were still building our own uh, processors. So that was a, a big shift for us. And I, initially, I thought it was a dumb idea. I mean, it ch changes all the time. Moore's Law and things go obsolete. Uh, you know, how do I support this thing? What happened was, you know, after seeing what our situation was on the operational side, then we had to get real. You know, hey, our budget probably isn't going to increase much, if at all. Uh, we've got a real problem here. There are certain areas of the world we can't operate in anymore because we don't have that standoff range. So we had, we had to, to, to change things. And one of the first things we did was take a look at where we are, kind of baseline where we are, and make some, and set some points on where we'd like to be. Where do we think we need to be? One thing we thought was that, well, we're not going to, with the, with the money we have, and it's all split up, let's, we call it cauterizing the legacy systems. 
let's not change them at all anymore. And let's combine the, the funds that we had for those legacy systems and come up with a new approach that would be applicable to all submarines. And by the way, applicable to uh, surveillance systems and surface ship systems as well. And so that was one of the ground rules we had starting up. The other was that we weren't going to do, with the people we had, we had a lot of naysayers. We had a lot of people that were still in the mode of this is going to cost a lot more. Uh, we're the only ones that can do it. Uh, we've already got the best and the brightest on our program. And we did have, and we do have, very smart people on the program. But my feeling was that that's not enough. There's other people out there that are smart. Uh, let's hear from them too. And when we get them involved, let's do it on an equal basis. So, you know, how do we make things equal? And I think one of the big uh, things that we did that was very important was we, we use the term transparency, but how do, we, how do we let everybody know what we're doing, how we're making decisions? Let's start making decisions based on merit versus political position, or we've always done it this way. You know, let's even the scale. Let's show everybody how we make those decisions. And so our new approach was, you know, let's get this system in place, and we don't have any time to waste. Let's do it quickly. And we can't do the whole thing, all of sonar, all at once quickly. So let's do a piece of it and do that quickly. And we also said, well, let's, let's hit a home run. It's very important that this first system really make a difference in terms of that operational scenario there. Let's back it off. So we, we looked at the part of our sonar we that uses what we call a toad array. It's like a long hose filled with underwater microphones, hydrophones, we call them. And let's, let's do it there. Let's concentrate on that first. And we have different types of toad arrays, so let's pick the one that they use most of all. And so we, we got a system out, fielded at sea in 18 months, which was unheard of before. And we didn't go through and change the, the legacy system. We bypassed it. We put together what we call a COTS tumor, commercial off the shelves tumor. So we did this. We, here's the input is coming from the array. We bypassed the, the uh, legacy beam formers and signal processors and displays and come up with this Cox tumor approach to improving total rate performance. And we did it in 18 months. And it wasn't something that we dictated. We set up a, a, a collaborative system where we had the prime contractor and Navy laboratories, but also invited uh, industry, uh, small business industry, and university labs to participate in this as well. And some of our best ideas came from them. But probably the, the, the best idea is the ones that made, I think, the biggest difference came from the fleet itself. We had operators that were handpicked from each, each command, and we had about nine of them. And we brought them in, and we asked, well, what do you want? And these guys were all pretty seasoned operators, and they weren't bought into that we've always done it this way. They, they, uh, they, went to sea with foreign systems. They looked at it from different perspectives. They, were, they had their own ideas of what they'd like to see. You know, why don't they do it this way? And they came up with some really good ideas that none of our engineers would have come up with on their own. And so we, we had this group that would put together a list of what we would want to do and which things we should do first. And then we set it off. And we, so we had this four-phased approach with every phase delivering operational capability that was measured based on actual data. And we showed that to everybody. And we also kept other kinds of data, how much things cost, uh, I was managing the program, so I wanted to know, you know, who was involved, how, many, how much manpower we had. Well, as it turned out, my program office had 50% less manpower than we did before. And we were doing it all, just from duplication of effort. Our budget went down 70% from how we did it before, just eliminating duplicated effort. 
And we found that uh, our prime contractor, who had overrun on almost every program we ever had, he improved his game. Because if he didn't, a small business or somebody else could take it over. And what we found was that when this went, went to sea, it was so successful that the fleet you know, wanted us to skip phase two and go right to phase three. And the other thing we did with this, we, it was an open system. We call it an open system. So we had a continual update program. So we updated the software and the hardware every year for the first four years, which was unheard of before. And so the idea, and I've heard it talked about a couple of times before, be able to make changes quickly and smoothly. That's what we had, that's what we did. And uh, I would say that um, the biggest issues had to do with wrapping up this program. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest issues had, I agree with uh, Peter, leadership. It does not get done without good leaders. Let me, let's go to the next uh, slide, please. How do I go back? I went too far. Okay, let's go to the next one. So this is something I picked up at Harvard at their Kennedy School. You know, acceptance versus time. In the beginning you have the pioneers and early adopters and then it gets mainstream. And there's this gap there, that's the valley of death. You know, a lot of these ideas don't get past that alley, valley of death. Okay, go to the next one please. So here are some of the things that, not all of it, that's not a complete list, but some of the things I think, you know, made that uh, spanning the valley of death feasible. And one is make the vision of what we do in relative, relevant to the warfighter. The guy at the pointy end of the spear, you want him to be impressed with this. You want him to see a difference. You know, in your case, it, it was the doctors and nurses maybe in the, in the, in the, in the, you know, in the hospital, dealing with the patients, or it could be the patients. Second one, in, establish incremental performance goals based on fleet's needs. Again, you know, what are your needs and what are the goals we're gonna set and how do we do it? Like Peter said, engineers wanna solve problems. You know, tell them what the problem is and they'll figure a way to get it. Select leaders at all levels who can deal with uncertainty without losing sight of the vision and reward success. You know, leaders capable of doing this are very hard to find. You know, I liken it to, you know, in the military especially, you have a lot of people that fancy themselves as good leaders. Well, they can run a train and be on schedule. But when you get to the area where you're out there where there's no tracks, you know, and you got Indians to deal with, you know, and you're going in a new direction, you need a, a good leader that understands that. And when, and when you get one, you gotta reward them. Okay, develop and call by allies at all levels, the strongest ally in the fleet. In our case, it was the operational fleet and then Congress. Believe it or not, we had people in Congress that had a, had a big uh, um, small business initiative. You know, how do we get these small guys involved? It paid a lot of dividends for us. Involve industry, especially non-traditionals, in the formulation of strategies and architectures. Well, we did that. We did it as a group, as a collaborative effort. And we, you know, I, I strove to keep the, the table level. You know, let everybody say their piece. And we selected the ways to go based on the merit. Okay, and st still within the team, a sense of entrepreneurial spirit. Okay, I think we got a lot out of you know, hitting a home run in that first phase and every other phase. And I think everyone on the program felt like they were contributing. And it wasn't that they just saw the, the value of it, but the, the end user saw the value of it too. So it became a pull situation. We weren't pushing this stuff on them and they were trying to figure it out. You know, they were wanting more. And they were c coming back and saying, hey, we'd like you to do this. I remember one time, uh, in our first, uh, we call it advanced processing build, but the fleet, uh, you know, pretty much dictated what they wanted, and we gave them exactly what they wanted, 
And then when they took it on deployment and they came back and said, well, we give ourselves a 70%, but we have confidence that you can give us that 30% we missed. And so they really felt like they were in a driver's seat. <clears throat> Bill, we're going to have to move on to uh, Meredith next. Uh, I'm done. Commit and be accountable. <laughs> hey, um, <clears throat> thanks. But I hope that gave you a flavor for that other industries have evolved towards this with the yes. leadership and demand for procurement. Uh, our next speaker is Meredith Alliger who is Vice President for Economics and Value at the Center for Medical Oper Interoperability. And this is an organization that is doing this in healthcare now. It's one of the leading ones who's moving in this direction. And we're delighted to hear Thank from you. Thank you, Dr. Perenovos. Thank you, Bill, for all of the lessons that we can learn from the um, submarine interoperability. There are so many transferable lessons that, um, that can be applied here in healthcare, most especially um, your point about transparency about really letting the industry see what is going on, how we're making our decisions, and about the um, involving, um, in your case, the operators, but in our case, the clinicians, the caregivers at the point of care, the people who are delivering the healthcare infrastructure, and the people who are receiving healthcare. We need to, we need to involve them in the design process. We, we don't need to make the mistake that we've made so many times in developing these large systems, whether it's reimbursement systems, whether it's IT systems, we really, really need the input of the subject matter experts. And in our case, that's the clinicians and caregivers at the point of care all the way up and down. So thank you for the privilege of attending um, this event. Thank you um, for the honor of being able to contribute uh, to the publication along with so many of you um, to, to, to raise awareness for this and thank you for the National Academy of Medicine for giving it a platform. Um, I really enjoyed uh, writing parts of this paper. The parts that I enjoyed most um, really were, were those that allowed me to, to understand and really unpack the reasons um, that have not only led to our current situation, which Dr. Um, Adler Milstein writes about and examines so thoroughly in her work, um, uh, but also <clears throat> how to think about how we go forward, um, how we go forward in a strategic way that not only ensures our financial sustainability in healthcare, but how we ensure that we are um, achieving our dual mission of providing the clinical and patient-centered care that we um, owe to our patients in our community. So <clears throat> I'm not going to read this, but this is a diagram that many of you have seen before. Uh, many of you probably recognize. It's uh, the great Michael Porter, Five Forces. You won't find this online because we don't have this. We don't talk about it. Um, we don't look at it very often. And this is just to kind of show you this in a, in a spirit of transparency to start the dialogue about why it is, why we are we, where we are, but also um, try to examine the forces that are at play to try to um, understand those forces, examine them, and, and to move forward. So you've all seen the five forces diagram. You, know, you all know why the suppliers are in the position that they're in, why they're not creating products that necessarily de deliver comprehensive interoperability comprehensive interoperability as defined in the paper is interoperability through all levels. So at the point of care, the medical devices around the patient, the EHR around the patient, the caregivers, everything, this, all the mobile devices, everything that collects information about the patient at the level of the individual, all the way through the enterprise, all the way from system to system. So that's what we define as comprehensive interoperability. Um, that's what we at the Center for Med Medical Interoperability and many of you, I know we're wrestling with the definition of interoperability, but that's kind of what we consider that it is. It's a system that enables the liquidity of data all the way up and down and <coughs> vertical and horizontally. So just to kind of set the stage for that. So you can see, I'll try to go quickly because I know we're, we're backed up on time, but um, you know, the, the levers that are at play here, the forces that are at play, um, we're, we're in a state of gridlock. We, we have a marketplace that is, is not open to new entrants. We have high barriers to entry because of the nature of our products, because of the nature of our, our capital structure in healthcare. 
And um, this is not a healthy marketplace. Um, this, this I'd like to think is uh, the marketplace that we strive for. So it's one where um, the buyers, the, the healthcare systems, the GPOs, and by extension, the, the patients and communities whom they serve are in the position not only to demand interoperability through specifications, um, but ha have a demonstrated reason for doing so. So that's the other side of the coin. It's not enough that we convene and aggregate the procurement power. That's step one, and it's a huge step. But the other part of that is to really prove the business case. It's to really prove that these systems reduce the cost of its goods sold, reduce operational <coughs> expense, um, improve efficiencies. That's step one, all of this, before we can get to measuring um, sort of the, the lagging indicators and the later impact on patient safety and our ability to deliver care over the continuum and clinical outcomes, we have to first demonstrate a business case for doing this. So that's what we're doing. We're putting together literally business models to measure um, the costs that can be taken out of the system when you adopt and implement interoperable systems. And not just, we, we don't think that's EHR to EHR or a suite of connected um, devices. It starts with what Bill describes and what you will hear many of the technical experts in our field and other fields describe later with a platform model, a trusted platform model that is neutral, that is um, created in collaboration between vendor, the vendor community and the health system community. Um, it's agreed upon, it's open, and, and it's accessible, and it's developed for, really, it's like a public good. It's a public utility. And in that way, it becomes accessible and scalable. Scale is what we have um, not been able to achieve thus far um, through our consortia. You know, as admirable as the intents may be, we haven't achieved the scale that we really need. So um, we need the scale through the aggregation of procurement power, but we also need the scale of our, our technical platforms. So, <clears throat> so it's great. We're, we've, this, this paper has given us a platform. Everybody's kind of starting to get religion about this. Um, 2018 seems to be the year of transparency, you know, and all kinds of things. But um, the people are starting to get it, you know, and we have the will. Now we need to organize around the way. So what is, what is the way? How do we create the marketplace that you saw in the second diagram? So uh, very quickly, um, we think that you have to, um, the, the opportunity to be successful in doing this is not going to require imp incremental improvement around the fringe. It's going to require transformational change. So, you know, define that. It's been defined already, but um, it's going to be hard. It's going to be complicated, but it's not beyond our capacity to do so. It's a choice. Um, we will hear from Oscar Marcia, who's built the, the security layer and the technical infrastructure that supports the cable industry. Um, there are so many different examples in the paper and folks in this room have, who have actually operationalized this in other industries and it's important that we gather those lessons and um, try to act upon them and, and reuse them. No need to reinvent the wheel. So um, we think again, I mentioned the trusted, the trusted model and our CTO Ed Miller will speak um, in, in great length detail about that later. Um, as I emphasized first, we need to involve the clinicians and the caregivers in the design. They need to be involved in creating the technical requirements for this system. If, if they're not, then what the, what's the point of doing this? We may as well create another prospective payment system because that didn't involve the clinicians either. So, um, and then lastly, what is the business case? How can we demonstrate in the near term how interoperable systems remove cost and give us um, create a real economic incentive. We don't have to lean on government incentives, you know, create a real opportunity and an opportunity to welcome private investment into healthcare, which has been lacking. So the key to understanding where we go from here um, <laughs> is I think we have to ask ourselves what it is that we really want. And I think it's easier to answer that question um, not, you know, not when you look through the lens of your company, um, 
but when you re when you start to look through the lens um, as just a simple person, as yourself, as a patient. So, just a little side note here. Um, <clears throat> let me tell you how I really came to understand this. This is me. Um, this is me with my me medical record from the year 20, uh, 2001 to present. Um, these aren't all the binders. I'm sure I missed a couple notes here and there, but um, I'm pretty OCD. Um, I guess I could be more OCD, seeing that you know the top binder is really disorganized, and you see the that you know the apple there is for scale. But um, <laughs> so I, I had Hodgkin's when I was 19. I'm fine. I'm supposed to live a really long life. Um, uh, but I have to be careful, and you know I have to be a little more vigilant about some things. And when I go to my doctor, I have lots of questions about my health and about my future risks. Um, uh, my risks, like should I get pregnant? Should I, you know, I had adriamycin. Am I going to develop spontaneous postpartum cardiomyopathy? What, you know, real risks. Um, these are questions that we can't talk about because. This stack of paper hasn't been harmonized and synchronized in a way that I have time to talk about it in 15 minutes. Even if I sent this in advance, they're not going to read it. And there's no way to make sense of this. There's no way to trend my, my laboratory data. There's no way to you know, sync my image studies with my genetic reports, with my social data, with um, you know, my, how I lead my life, my nutrition. Um, so. You know, I basically just take a gamble about the choices that I make. I'm basically just, um, you know, trying to trying to make informed choices, but I can't make informed choices. If the healthcare industry were able to help me answer these questions, that's real value, and that's what we should be striving for. So that's my north star. You know, that's that's um, that's really what I try to think about when I when when I approach this problem. So. I know that we're all capable of doing it. I applaud you all for uh, being involved in this. Again, thank uh, Dr. Pronovost and, and everyone in this room for being a part. So thank you. Great, Merida. Thank you. Common themes of leadership and open architecture to create innovation. You're next, going to hear from Oscar Marcia. Uh, Oscar, CEO of ENT, a company, but mostly we want him to speak with us because of what he helped lead in the cable industry, another example of that we can do this in healthcare. Sure, thank you, and, and thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, Bill's slide about the, uh, the budget cut on the, uh, um, the uh, you know, during, during the drop of the Cold War reminded me kind of where I started. I was, was actually working on submarine hunting technology at that time. And because of the cut, I had to kind of find a different path. <laughs> <Interesting. Yeah. laughs> That's a great so, so eventually that led me to Cable Labs. And, and Cable Labs is a, is a research and development consortium for the cable industry. Um, how many of you have cable devices in your houses? You know, you have your modems, your set-top box. Your, well, all of that came through Cable Labs, right? So, so um, what the consortium does, um, it, it, I, I think the, the industry must have seen that, that diagram of the five forces, because that's kind of where they were, right? The, the, the suppliers were dictating, uh, they were le proprietary legacy devices that were costing them a, a lot, um, and they were not interoperable. So they decided to, to kind of come together as an industry. A couple of things there that are different, though, in the cable industry, uh, it's what I call regional monopolies. They don't really compete with each other. So one cable industry is one city, and they kind of play nice together. So it's a great um, kind of forum for them to come together and share and work together. And so that's, that's what they did. And, and w what they did there was, was change the balance of that diagram to, to really uh, use their, their procurement uh, power to migrate the vendor industry in the direction that they wanted, which was interoperable devices, secure devices, uh, and, and, and uh, retail devices. Uh, and so uh, over the years, uh, so I started there in 2000, uh, and, and I was the VP of security for 15 years. So my part was the security side. But I was just leveraging that procurement strategy that that cable industry came came. And so what, what Cable Labs does and what they did was they, they create um, interface specifications. They don't create standards. They create interface specifications. 
And so that is the interface between that device in your home, whether it's the modem, the set-top box, the, the voice over IP box, to the head end. And they, they write the specification and really dictate what happens in the boxes on either end, but just the, the interface side. And so um, over the years, um, that DOCSIS 1.0 grew into uh, in the last version now is DOCSIS 3.1. But over that time, uh, so it's a span of about 15 years, um, uh, globally, uh, the rest of the world was taking note, and, and these are publicly available specs, and, and people can use them. So you had a Euro DOCSIS, you had a China DOCSIS, you had US DOCSIS, and, and so the world was taking note and, and leveraging the, the work that was done in cable apps. In that 15 years, um, it went from those three major DOCSIS re regions to the DOCSIS 3.1 is now a global standard that the, the world uses. So it's global, it's DOCSIS 3.1. Uh, where I come in is, is, is leveraging that ability uh, to, to put in the security. So the, the cable industry was, was concerned with data privacy, uh, with theft of service, uh, and, and so, um, uh, common provisioning, and so a lot of the things that you're, you're starting to see in, in, in your industry, uh, you know, software download, so all of those things, uh, because I had that leverage and that interoperability, I was able to overlay the security piece on there. So all the devices you have in your home that are cable service have a digital certificate that comes from my group when I was there. Uh, they all do software download the exact same way, because that's just the way I implemented it when, when it was there. And so we were able to achieve some of the things that you're looking at. Now, you know, cable, um, internet, phone, video, different types of services that, that you uh, are looking at in the healthcare industry. But a lot of the similar lessons learned can be, can be applied. Um, one of the things that, you know, after 15 years there, I kind of launched my own, my own company, uh, Ianti, and, and I took that same model. And, and the reason we did that was because we had done it for cable, and we were seeing other critical infrastructures coming online, asking the same questions, same, same, same questions you're, you're, you're asking, same, same ideas that you're dealing with uh, in the smart energy, uh, aviation. Uh, so actually, we are just starting to create the, um, the secure communications between ground devices at airports. So my company is going to kind of take that cable labs model and apply it to all the airports in the world. Mm -hmm. So when you go through the airport and uh, one of the earlier panels said there was a de-icing. You know, that truck talks to the plane, talks to the gate, talks to, there's, there's so many devices um, that, that are at an airport, uh, and it's kind of like a small city, so it, it, it leans itself to some of the things that we were looking at. So we're just bringing that model in. So you can take a very uh, diverse set of products, vendors, uh, political regions and stuff, and, and, and you can solve these problems. And you can solve them by, by again, it, it all started with, with, and it starts with that procurement strategy, that interoperability right. strategy, and then it just makes my life easier. Right. So that, that's, that's kind of, like I said, that's where we are now. So. Great, thank you. And why don't we open it up for questions uh, from the audience? Julie? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. So, uh, oh, okay, because there's people on the phone. So I was struck by the examples that they started with either a crisis or existential threat. And when I think about Meredith, your story, right? It started with a personal health crisis. You know, the patient safety movement was kicked off by Tara is human and this image of a 747 crashing every day. I worry that we don't have a perceived interoperability crisis. And so I wonder if each of you could speak to the importance of starting with a crisis and how we might raise the visibility of the crisis that we're suffering now from lack of interoperability. Yeah, Julia, I, th I think you're spot on, and, and uh, not being too dramatic, I think our inability to solve the healthcare po um, cost problem is the biggest threat to the future of the American dream. If you look at the one third of waste that we have in healthcare, a trillion dollars, that's equal, it's about $10,000 per, per family to the median net worth of those people in Baltimore who you may have seen on TV during the social unrest. I mean, that's literally what we're wasting. Or people in Appalachia, again, same thing. And when you look at 
places like Massachusetts, and I know we have others from Massachusetts, when they expanded healthcare coverage, which was great, it came at the expense of other social services, other investments in STEM and preschool and parks. And so not getting this healthcare right isn't just healthcare, it's we're not gonna have the future labor productivity or other social goods. So I, I truly think it is an existential issue and, and we haven't budgeted it with our current approaches. I think the, uh, the, the lack of, of data sharing, da data is king. Right. If you look around, everything, all Google, um, you, Uber, everything that you do, your Fitbit, uh, you know, there's an article in, 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 in paper this morning about Fitbit and people using it to track where the military bases are around the world. That's because data, right? And so that's, when, when you and your industry are not using, not collecting it, not using it, n not uh, realizing the value of the data, I, I see that as one of the major crises. Yeah, it can help personally, and, and those are the benefits, and, and you can use that as the, you know, the patient has to, uh, if you can make it much easier to transfer data from one institution to another where the patient can get their questions, it, it leads to better quality of care. But I think there's also another level, once you can do that and share the data, there's going to be another layer of things you can do with that data that you never knew you could do with it before. And, and if you look around everything, everywhere else, they're doing the data. You know, data is king. And so if you're not doing the correct thing with data, that is a major crisis and it'll affect your industry at some point. Yeah, I'd say uh, in the case of the submarines, you can kill frogs by slowly heating them up or you can throw them in boiling water, you know. I, my, the sense I have is the healthcare issue is slowly heating them up. Uh, what we saw with the, in the uh, submarine case with that acoustic superiority issue that came up, that was boiling water. And uh, so I think, you know, I've, I've looked at a lot of programs that have done transformational things, and what I see is boiling water. For a lot of it. Right. Sure, we'll go in the back and then to Stephen. If you could just say your name also. Sure. Uh, Janet Marchabroda with uh, Bipartisan Policy Center again. We're really excited about um, this event today. We love the idea of using private sector procurement activities to drive interoperability. I had a question maybe for, is it Saizen? Or, or Peter, I remember in the pre-high-tech days, we spent a lot of time with employers and with doctors coming up with common RFI language. But as I was flipping through your report, it seems like you're calling for each individual institution to have an interoperability steering committee, and then they'll develop their own measures. I was just, uh, versus having some uh, common for the country, I was wondering what your rationale was around the many versus e even, you know, a band of large hospitals, small, you know what I mean? So that's the question. Yeah, thank you. No, you're absolutely right. And I think um, the, the recommendation is to the extent possible to leverage what the DOD is doing and what the VA is doing and to have some of these larger um, organizations to band together and come up with a set of common uh, interoperability standards and implementation guidelines. So that's what we are uh, recommending, and the means by which you can do that is to have this interoperability steering group that can work across organizations and come up with that common language. So uh, the description that we gave in terms of what each organization can do is, is focused on within an organization, but the idea is that they would work across as well, across those ISGs to come up with common language. So thank you, thanks for that question. Great. And I I might just add to that because you're spot on. You know, many of our contracts do have requirements, but they're compared to an engineer, which I'm not. There's such a high level that you could easily say you meet those, but there's no value there. And I think the difference between what cable or submarine did is they, you know, went from a paragraph of specs to 200 pages. I don't think that's realistic. That. Uh, every organization can do that. I also don't think we're all gonna get consensus, and so at least a vision I have is there might be a group that produces something that is a public document, that is a skeleton of requirements, and if the VA wants to tweak it for their needs, or Cleveland Clinic tweaks it, they don't have to start from, from scratch, but it's, it's, a, it's a you know beginning of a document. Yeah, I, I just wanna add 
uh, in answer to your question of the burning platform. Um, I think implicit in what you said, Peter, is that it, th there is this incredible amount of cost, but it is coupled with poor outcomes. So I, I, and I think the two together are what is really startling about our healthcare system. Now, you brought it together as an individual with your picture, but um, the, the situation that we're dealing with is, you know, we're pushing 20% of the GDP. Everybody in this country is not covered, and our outcomes compared to comparable com co countries around the world don't make it. So that is the burning platform as far as I'm concerned. I think it is actually getting to individuals more than we understood, and I think um, the inability to be so far to repeal let alone replace, leave regulation over here. Um, it shows that. It's not popular. People are enjoying having an expanded healthcare system with coverage, and they have signed on. So we just have to keep hitting it that in a country like ours, we need the outcomes that exist in Europe. I'm uh, Matt Quinn. I'm the Senior Advisor for Health Technology at HRSA. Um, one of the things that, that caught my ear was the, the, the notion of comprehensive interoperability. So going well beyond just electronic health records into devices, maybe remote patient monitoring, telehealth, home-based devices, medical devices. Um, do we interpret that the provisions for information blocking and 21st century cures apply to all of those? And how, do, how would we define information blocking in those contexts that are beyond just any HR? I think that might be a question for Oh, I don't know that I'm an expert in uh, the legislation that might be. <laughs> and a question for um, Don Rucker or, or Andy. Um, or Okay, <laughs> that was probably. Smart move, but uh, no, I don't think that you guys have defined that quite yet. Well, I think what you're getting at is um, what Peter's, I think, slide about the, I like the meso in there. Um, obviously, the historic focus of ONC and of high tech has been more on the call it classic EMR side of things rather than the device side um, because those things I think tend to be more externalized and hence maybe arguably maybe um, more susceptible amenable to policy and regulation rather than things that sit within the enterprise um, but to to Steve's point it, it does strike me when you when you look at as if we're going to do industry analogies, we don't have an ERP type of system in healthcare, right? The EMRs, for all the reasons we know, um, don't actually lead to a whole lot of internal efficiency. I mean, internally, it's an extraordinary labor-intensive industry. Um, the manual communication is fascinating. I did did some software programming, looking where I was at. Um, one large institution, 10% of the entire FTE time, if you just parse computationally the voice over IP log files was spent on phone calls. 10% of the entire FTP time. That, by definition, is not automation. Um, and so I think the internal interoperability, whatever you call it, redesign, systems reengineering, are great opportunities. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Ash Sanus. I am the Chief Medical Officer for the EHR Modernization Project for the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, working for Secretary Shulkin. I'm so excited to be here and to hear all of you uh, contribute because I'm taking notes frantically over here. Um, I read through the report quickly and I just had two comments. Um, I wanted to say uh, we have a large uh, board 
consisting of all of the members of Congress who are rapidly uh, <laughs> firing new legislation at us, sometimes uh, that counters the previously passed legislation just you know, a few months to a year ago. So as uh, this consortium looks at writing um, uh, policies, we want you to keep the veteran legislation and policy in mind and encourage the commercial off-the-shelf um, systems and their providers to keep veteran policy in mind so that you can either make comments or change or add to that um, as we go through uh, policy changes. In the past, it's been really easy because we've sort of stuck with um, homegrown systems and you know, if they talk about document level tweaks, we can go in for privacy and standardization at the document level, uh, we can make our own changes. But now that we're moving away and entering the commercial world, uh, it's really important that we are all right. playing together in the same field. And I encourage that, you know, um, all of you think about, you know, the technological flexibility with the evolving policy changes and that you comment on it and speak up and encourage the commercial systems to kind of come on board so that we can all be together. Uh, my second point is um, I know that, um, Peter, you're um, really a large driver for uh, improved um, healthcare value when you look at uh, data standardization and data elements. Um, but I think uh, in, our, um, in our experience at VA, uh, we've traditionally used, most of the health information exchanges use um, the record locator service, the query find uh, system just as a way to visually display and nothing gets incorporated or used. Um, and while that may work at the micro tier level, at the macro level, it just doesn't work. Uh, and as we enter the market and we have all of these community care providers and we have to share information, we want to make it you know, valuable and useful and also uh, contribute towards the CMS um, uh, reporting requirements, et cetera, which I think there's a lot of room there to grow. And uh, I really applaud that you took a look at that and put that into this report. And I just want to kind of highlight and say, um, you know, if you can sort of support some of those um, data elements actually being ingested and um, put into the EMRs and encourage that or even incentivize folks to do that so that we can report out at a, you know, given our scope at a much larger level, I think we can move how healthcare value, you know, is uh, delivered to a more value-based system. So thank you so much. Great, Th thank you. And, and given where you are at the VA and you and your with your procurement strategies, I think thinking of forward-looking, bringing green, you know, groups together to really increase that buyer's power is a huge opportunity for us. Other questions or comments? Oh, all right. I want to move on. Make it time. Well, thank you all very much, and uh, thanks to the pan thanks to the panelists.